Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Belfield talking to some of the country's biggest stars and some of my favourite people. And we've definitely got one for you today. Simon Rimmer, how are you? Oh, bless you. I'm good, Alex. I'm really good, thanks. Do you know, it's so lovely to talk to you. There you've been on the telly box for ages doing what you do, and you keep it classy. You don't get up to shenanigans, fall out of clubs, or end up on the front page of the papers, do you? I don't have time, honestly. That's, <laughs> that's, my, that's my whole life's ambition, but um, I just don't seem to have the time to do it. I'm just too busy. <laughs> You know what? I, I, I'm I'm very lucky. I have the best job in the world. Sunday brunch is, is the best job in the world. But then outside of it, you know, I do have a real job. You know, I have 16 restaurants and I have a wife and two kids. So yeah, you know, I don't I don't really have time for anything else. I'm amazed how difficult it is to be a world class chef, and you are. I mean, it's relentless, isn't it? Every day you start again from the beginning. It's not like yesterday you achieve your goal and then tomorrow you can just sit back on your laurels. Every day you've got to prove, and every meal is sort of as good as your last, isn't it? It is. I mean, you know, I think now that we're, you know the, the business is in the state where you know we're, we're kind of big enough that I have a great team of people alongside of me. You know, I've got a sort of team of five who are my sort of senior team. Um, who do a, an awful lot of, of tremendous work. Um, but now I think the joy that you get is seeing your new superstars coming through. Mm. You know, I, I want to develop people who have the same passion and love for food and cooking as I do. And when you see that happening, it, it's just so lovely. It's so joyous you know, to see somebody who gets the bug to become a chef. It's, it's a great feeling. Tell me what's more important. Is it being on the telly to get bums on seats in the restaurant or is it making sure that the food in the restaurant is good enough so people don't tweet nasty things? What, what's your preoccupation when you wake up in the morning? I think um, your number one is always that you want the food to be brilliant. You know, that, that is the mm. thing that, that will never waver. Every single day you want the, the teams in all of the sites to do the very, very best that they can so that when you sit down, it's the best that it can ever be. So that is always going to be number one. Um, but I think certainly, you know, having a profile without a shadow of a doubt, you know, d- does wonders for the business. Um, but, you know, if if you want to come and eat one of my restaurants and you roll up and the food isn't good, you aren't going to come back. Mm. And, you know, that that's a reality. So it's always going to be about food. I interviewed a very, very famous chef, probably one of the three top chefs in the world, and I sat and had dinner with him in his restaurant. And he sent the meal back, the look on the server and the chef's face. I mean, there can't be there can't be a worse thing for any chef to have your boss send the food back. Are you always obsessively looking at everything that leaves the kitchen? Because you've got to be sort of a megalomaniac in a way, because that's how you become so brilliant. Everything. Absolutely everything. Um, mm. And, you know, I have had not a dissimilar experience in, in one of my sites, um, and it, it is terrible um, because, you know, you, you, you do have to be a perfectionist. There's no two ways about it. And don't get me wrong, you know, the, 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 the favourite chef, I'll be nameless, that you mentioned, I'm nowhere near in his league, but um, in, in terms of, you know, execution of what I do, but the, the passion and, and pride and perfection at my level that I want is, is exactly the same. So, yeah, you, 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 and you can never let your guard down. Mm. The minute you start going, ah, oh, that'll do. That's a dangerous one. But it's no different. It's, it's the same in any job. In your job, Alex, it's exactly the same. You know, if you come to interview somebody and you haven't prepared it properly, then if you don't get a great interview out of that person, that's your fault, isn't it? Do, Absolutely. Do prep. Yeah. yeah. And we're going to get to that next because that's your other job, interviewing people, which you do superbly. Um, first, though, let's talk about being a parent and, of course, cooking for your kids, because this is one of the biggest debate that's gone on. Is food too expensive? And is that an excuse to be a bad parent and not feed your kids properly? Or are there other alternatives? And Flora have done this new research, which is interesting, about breakfast. Yeah, it, it, it's it's. It's frightening in certain extent. So 1,500 parents were interviewed by Flora of, of, with kids of primary school age, so 4 to 11. And it's all about breakfast. And almost two-thirds of them revealed that on a semi-regular basis that kids will leave the house without having had breakfast. And I find that shocking. I mean, as an adult, if I leave the house without breakfast, it doesn't take long for me to become a little bit grumpy, not particularly good at a job, almost running a little bit on autopilot. So if you're doing that with young kids, then it, it, it's quite disturbing. And particularly, breakfast is the most straightforward meal of the day, really. Mm. Yeah, it really is. It shocks me that that happens. What is it then? Is it time? Is it the fact that everybody's so damn busy doing jobs and therefore you've just got to get the kids to school to survive? It's tricky, isn't it? Because I don't want to get into the blame game, which some chefs have got into, and it's sort of backfired. But at the same time, you have a duty to feed your kids. And if they go to school hungry, they're never going to perform, are they? Completely. 
and, and I think it isn't about kind of blame. It's about creating good habits. I always think that any form of, of eating, if you create good habits, you're more likely to succeed. I know that when my kids were little, I would get them involved with cooking breakfast. Let's face it, breakfast can be, you know, from a healthy point of view, a piece of whole grain toast, you know, with just some simple spread in it, maybe a little bit of peanut butter. It can be a bowl of cereal with some milk in it. It can be some fruit that you chop into a bowl with a little bit of yogurt on top. Mm. We're not cooking here. You know, we're doing very, very simple processes. What I found I like to do was kind of simple things like if I put the milk in a jug, I found that my kids wanted to pour it themselves, so they got involved. If I let them cut the banana, if they were making a fruit salad, they wanted to do that. If they were putting yogurt on top of their fruit and a little squeeze of honey, they wanted to do that. It gave them good habits, and those good habits make them want to get more excited by the food. If they make their own food, they're going to be happy. From a parent's point of view, all we're talking about doing is, say, to use my example, pouring milk into a jug having the spread already there for them to put onto their toast, having a banana there with a little knife for them to cut it, mm. have the yogurt there, have the honey and the little squeezer bottle to squeeze. Those are very, very simple things to do. We are not talking about saying, right, I need my children to make a hollandaise sauce to go on their eggs benedict in the morning. We're right. talking very simple things, but they create good habits. I think we've got to be smarter about it. And we've also got to get away from this theory that McDonald's is cheaper than doing a, a, a three-course meal. I'm amazed how cheap vegetables are in most supermarkets. Markets. To argue you can't cook a proper, well-balanced meal cheaper than eating out is nonsense. I, I think we can all agree on that, right? You're completely right. I, I think, though, no, alongside that to, to balance it, you have things like opportunity and knowledge. So we have two, if not three, generations of adults in this country who've never been taught how to cook. Um, we removed um, catering and, and home economics from the school curriculum mm. way back um, in the 80s. Um, and then from, from um, school dinner's point of view, we removed kitchens from an awful lot of schools back in the 80s as well. And everything was brought in from the outside, which reduced the nutritional value in it. So you've got a generation of adults who can't do it. Then you have opportunity sweeping generalization so if you live in a deprived area of Britain your opportunity to go out and buy fresh fruit and vegetables within walking distance of your house is much less than if you live in a more affluent area of the UK and that has to change mm. I had a discussion with Alex Samner at the time with Scotland's first minister um, a good few years ago saying I would only allow the big supermarkets to open these massive massive supermarkets outside of town if they came into deprived areas of inner city Britain every single day with fresh fruit and vegetables for people to buy and on a weekly basis created cooking lessons to teach adults how to cook for their kids. Mm. That's what will happen when I'm prime minister. And this is your message to Boris if he does anything. I mean, nutrition has got to be the backbone of all happiness of any society, hasn't it? I mean, if we're all fit and well, we're going to save money on the NHS and everything else. Prevention rather than cure. Let's educate rather than sort of say, right, okay, we've got this wrong and it's broken. Mm. Well, let's stop it being broken rather than trying to fix it. Let's kind of get the next generation to be empowered to make their lives better. You can find out more by going to Flora and uh, just put that into Google. It comes up and get all the information there. I want to talk to you about the business of being a chef. I was a critic for a while and I gave up doing it because it's too much like hard work. And what I noticed was how quickly restaurants are, go from being number one to closing. It's a brutal business. And of course, we just saw the Jamie Oliver stuff recently. I mean, I worked in Vegas for, I think, nearly 10 years reviewing restaurants and they've all gone. I mean, they'd gone within two years. Do you worry about that, that it is one of the most dangerous businesses in the world because because it's almost a fashion, isn't it? People come and then they find the next best one. It's a, it's a very romantic business. Um, it, it's one of those things that, you know, if you, you, you hear it an awful lot, you know, people say, oh, you know, I, I, I do an amazing dinner party. I should own my own restaurant. There is very little connection between mm. you doing a really great dinner party on a Saturday night for your mates to then feeding 200 people, unemploying staff, and deciding how are you going to get rid of your waste, what's your gross profit, how much is your electricity going to be, or what about your business rate? Mm. It's, it's a very, very brutal business. And you sort of think the cost of opening a restaurant is quite expensive. If you get it wrong at the start and you delay opening by a couple of weeks, you can almost be on the back foot and, and you're almost doomed to fail mm. um, from the outset. It, it is so, so hard. Um, I mean, I love it and I've been very, very fortunate, you know, over the years, you know, I've gone from kind of one site and we now have 16. Um, but it never stops being a challenge and mm. you can never, ever take your foot off the gas. And even more so now, you know, on a daily basis, that whole thing you said about going from number one to, to closing, 
we have we are full of keyboard warriors we are full yeah. kind of review sites and all of those things affect people you know if you're going to a new town a new city a new country we all tend to go to those review sites to say okay what are the top 10 restaurants is that always reflective you know mm. somebody who says i really don't like that restaurant that affects an overall rating of it and then if you kind of you know you look at what that person does in terms of other restaurants that they like you go yeah you know what they don't like that restaurant that you know we produce fresh food and we're sort of you know mid to upper market this person who's reviewed it their favorite restaurants are fast food chains and all you can eat buffet mm, it's no wonder they don't like mine however they've given me a two rating yeah. which affects my overall rating so it's it, you know it's not an exact science but it is they, they, they yield it reminds me of when i got an offcom complaint once and they said we're going to uphold it one person complained i said yes but what about the 159,999 people who didn't complain that's the trouble exactly. isn't it you know and often exactly. people are more likely to complain than they are to congratulate i want to congratulate you on the tv show i think you're so charming together and it's so refreshing to see people who genuinely seem to like their guests i think that's the key to your success isn't it it's quite authentic it, it really is we're very lucky we have an amazing team of people on sunday brunch and what we try and do is make it feel uh, hopefully that it's not a telly show um, you know, I, I've, I've always sort of said, I think that in many respects, I think Sunday Brunch has more in common with radio than it does with TV. I think you're right. It's incredibly yeah. laid back. You know, we don't try and pack it full of stuff. We don't try and make it happy and smiley all the time. We're quite content for it to be quite, quite arbitrary, really. And we are very lucky that, you know, now that we've been doing it for so long, that the guests get it. They, the guests know they can come on and they can, they can do their plug for whatever they're promoting. But equally, we find out daft things about them. Yeah. You know, you find out that you know, you've got a guest who collects two pound coins or that in a former life they were a carpet salesman. And Tim and I will kind of will milk that for us because it makes us laugh, yeah. you know, and, and we do like our guests. You know, we want them to go away having the best time ever. And, you know, if, if they do that, then it makes for a successful show. Congratulations on everything. I think you're so talented and the chemistry with Tim is, well, something you can't create. I guess from the beginning it was natural, was it? Or did it take time? No, it really was. I think, you know, the fact is that we're, we're similar age. We have kids of a similar age. We both love our football. We don't take ourselves too seriously, but we're very serious about what we do. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, we, we very quickly hit it off and we make each other laugh, which is, you know, what you want from your mates, isn't it? You know, you, you want them to make them laugh and you know how to push their buttons, which is yeah. something that we do to each other quite a lot. Simon, there's a souffle ready to come out of the oven. Thank you so much for your time. It's really lovely talking oh, to you. Thanks for everything. Thanks, mate. You too.